Okay, so calculation of beta. So there's another way to calculate beta, which is how we do it in practice. We take all the stock data and we measure the rate of return for a stock and we also get it for the market. And for the market, we use the Standard & Poor's 500, the S&P 500. And then we do a regression of those two returns. And that gives us the slope or the rate of change of the market return for the stock, Blandy's, relative to the market return for the S&P 500. So I'll show you how to compute a beta. It's a tab port beta. It's pretty straightforward. It sounds confusing, but it's not. So we're going to go data and data analysis, and we're going to pull up the regression down here, a regression, and we'll say, okay. And it's going to ask us, what is the Y? Y is Blandy's. And that's good. And then we say, what is X? And X is the market. And so we would then accept the defaults and say, okay. And so we get this regression result. I think you may have seen this in your prior class. Key piece here is the coefficient. So the coefficient there of the variable, not the intercept, of the X variable, X variable being the market return, is 0.6. So let me get rid of this one, just to not confuse matters. Uh, no fill. So the beta is the relationship between the X variable and the Y variable, namely the slope, is 0 0.60. And you recall that we had computed that previously and got a 0 0.60, all right? So beta is computed simply by doing a regression. I'll go back to the slide. A regression of the market as the X variable, the dependent or independent variable, and Y is the dependent variable. And we do that regression and we look at the statistics and we look at the X variable for the coefficient and that number is the beta. Okay, so that's how we do it. Websites, you could do, I guess, uh, betas for every single stock you ever look at, or you can be smart and let other people do the work for you. So Yahoo Finance and ValueLine.com, there are many, many financial analysis sources that will actually compute beta for all the stocks you might think about. And here uh, on the right is a set of examples of different stocks. Amazon showing their ticker symbol and the beta coefficients. And you'll see that they may use different timelines so they get slightly different results. But generally, we see that higher beta stocks are consistent. The marketplace also has bearing on kind of the mood and the demands of investors. So in this particular case, if the base case is this blue line here, let's say that there's an increase in the risk-free rate. In other words, the monetary practices and the world interest rate structure makes the U.S. Treasury bill rates have to go up. In the absence of any other change in the market risk premium, it's just going to be a parallel move up. We would still have this premium because the, this line is still showing a premium, but the baseline here specifically, where we have zero beta, we now have a higher required return equal to the market risk premium. That's the risk-free rate impact. The next impact is what happens if the market gets a little jittery and so at that point, the slope then rises. In other words, we need a higher premium for taking on risk. So that premium is the slope of the line. And therefore, if the market gets risk averse, it's going to demand higher return for taking risk. And therefore, the slope increases. So here, again, we're locking down the intercept, which means the risk-free rate is the same. However, because the market is jittery, and once more return, the slope rises, and that's why it has this shape. Next, we observe that we can use this, the relationship of a portfolio required rate of return to do investment manager evaluation. So let's say we have two investment managers, JJ and CC, where JJ makes 8.5% return and CC makes 9.5% return. So the question is, which one is a better manager? Now, it would be a trick question, otherwise it was too obvious, right? So you might think that CC is a better manager since they make 9.5%, but we're going to move to Excel and do better analysis using 
the relationship that we just derived. So if we go to portfolio managers, we say, okay, here are the data that we had previously, where, so we had 8.5 and 9.5, but let's look at statistics for the portfolio and the market. So notice that the risk-free rate is static. So I'll just put that in green. That's the same for both. It's a market condition and the market risk premium, that's the market as a whole. So that's also static information, but these are different. So this is where we're going to differentiate between JJ and CC. The required rate of return, you recall, is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. And so I'll copy that over. And so these are the rates of return that we should demand from these investors. So what do we notice? that the beta for CC is higher, quite a bit higher, 1.4. So we will demand a higher interest rate or higher rate of return for CC under and overperforming. If, if JJ made 8.5 and they should make 7.5, they overperformed by 1% and CC should make 11%, but they only made 9.5. So they're negative. So in this particular case, even though the original condition made it look like CC was a better manager, in fact, it's the other way around. So CC is negative and JJ is in good shape. Let's make it blue. All right. What was the initial assumption was incorrect that once we look at the risk borne by those two managers, we're actually better off with JJ. And so that's an illustration of how we can utilize this security market line, specifically looking at the portfolio beta to do a better evaluation of managers rather than just simply looking at their rate of return.